Okay, before we can start destroying our environment, we're going to need some starting geometry. To get that, we need an image with some transparency and a static body 2D, which is going to hold all of our collision shapes. I'll show you how my project gets our starting image later in the video, but we'll start with the fun bit. Once you've got your image and set it up as a texture on a sprite, and you've created your collision body 2D, we can start writing a script. I've created this method called build collisions from image. The first thing we do is instantiate a bitmap. A bitmap is just a matrix of true or false values, and we're populating it using this create from image alpha method. So we take our sprite texture, pass it into this. This will return a bitmap where all the alpha pixels from the sprite are false and everything in the sprite with an alpha greater than 0.1 will be a true value. I've got a line in here to help with debugging where we can print out what the sprite looks like at this particular moment and save it into a screenshots folder. If we uncomment this and run the game, my method gets called at the start of the game. And if we look in my screenshots folder, I had one created for each of my nodes that has a destructible script. The important one being our map sprite. So we have a bitmap of this where all these checkerbox squares are gonna be zero and all of our circles are gonna be one. So you've now got a bitmap that holds your image. All we need to do is call the bitmaps opaque to polygons method. Opaque to polygons doesn't have any documentation. I'm not sure what the epsilon's used for, but all we care about is the rect that we pass it. When we're calling it, the one argument we pass it is this rectangle, which specifies the section of the image that we should create polygons from. We're going to take the easy way out. We create a rectangle that is the exact same size as the entire image. So we'll get polygons from everything. And just like that, we have a bunch of polygons. Every island in the map will have its own polygon. When I'm talking about islands, I mean anything that's not connected to other things. So we'll have one island that covers this and one island for the rest of the map. Now we can loop through them and create a collision polygon 2D for each island. We take the points given to us by the bitmap, we map them from our viewport to our world, then we set the polygon shape on our collision polygon to those points and parent it to our static body 2D. And with that, we're all done. Just go to the debug menu, turn on visible collision shapes and run the game. See how it freezes for a second before our collision shapes get drawn? That's our opaque to polygons method building all of the collision shapes. If you hide that with a loading screen, you're basically done at this point. Now that we've seen how easy it is to get collision shapes from an image, let's look at how I'm setting up my sprite in this project. First up, it's worth noting that we only ever create geometry from an image at the start of the game. This is way too slow to do at runtime. So when we want to destroy things during the game, we use geometry destruction, which will be covered in another video. Now, if we look over at our scene tree here, we have a viewport and a sprite. Our sprite is a viewport texture. The image of the sprite is whatever the viewport would see. So how do we get the viewport to see what it needs to? We'll start off with some of our viewport settings. Going down the list here, we set our transparent background to true. You'll remember that our bitmap looks at the alpha value when it's creating collision polygons. By setting transparent background, everything in the viewport will have an alpha of zero by default. I have turned off the 3D stuff and changed my usage to 2D because we're only working with a 2D project. Vflip needs to be on because viewports draw themselves upside down by default. I read somewhere that your eyes work like that as well, but it makes no sense for us, so we're just going to flip everything the right way up. Next, we set our clear mode to never and our update mode to once. Our clear mode and update mode here are important, but we'll come back to them later in the video. With our viewport set up, we're ready to start looking at code. We'll start by looking at our ready function. We add ourselves to a destructible group, which we'll cover later. We grab a reference to our collision holder which is the static body 2D, so that we know where to put our collision polygons once we've created them. Then we get the destruction world size. This is the size of the sprite that our destruction node is attached to, which we need to size our viewport. We also use the world size to translate between viewport coordinates and world coordinates. Here we set our viewport size so that it matches to our parent. 
Now that our viewport matches the size of our parent sprite, our first step is to clone the parent sprite into our viewport. We do this using the duplicate method and we pass it through an argument of zero. This means it won't copy any of the signals or scripts from our parent into our copy. We then convert our duplicates position from world coordinate into our viewport coordinates and add it as a child of our viewport. We've now got a copy of the parent sprite in our viewport. Remember that this sprite is a viewport texture that has the data from our viewport and our viewport holds our parent. So we now have enough to call our build collisions from image. So everything would be working at this point, but we've got a few more housekeeping things. Looking back at our viewport, we've got our clear mode and update mode, which I said were important earlier. Clear mode can be set to never, always, and next frame. The default is always, which means that the very first thing the viewport does before rendering is to clear everything that was drawn last frame. Because our transparent background is enabled, this would mean that everything would have an alpha of zero. Never means that our viewport will never clear before rendering. If you imagine that you've got the Godot logo on the left-hand side of the screen, if you move the logo across the screen, and clear mode is set to never, we'll draw the logo in its updated position, but it will also show at its old position. And if you moved it slowly, so that it took several frames to move across, you'll still see it at each of those intervening positions. The final mode here is next frame. This clear mode means that the viewport will clear before the next render, and then it will set itself to never. That's useful if you're about to update things and you want everything cleared out to start from scratch for the next frame, but you don't want the overhead of clearing before every render. Our next option here is the update mode. This determines when the viewport should render. Disabled means that the viewport will never render anything, which makes it useless to us. When visible means our viewport will only render if it's actually displayed on screen. We never display this viewport, so it's useless to us as well. That leaves us with always and once. Always does exactly what it sounds like. Once is a lot like the next frame of clear mode. It will render the viewport once and then switch to disabled. I'm setting the clear mode to never in this project because we'll be writing some custom code to remove just the bits we don't want, rather than having to draw everything we do want on each frame. And I'm setting our update mode to once. Aside from the first draw, where we copy the parent sprite across, we're only ever going to draw our viewport if we trigger some destruction. Rather than rendering the viewport every frame, we'll just do it when we need to update it. So, back to our code. Straight after taking a copy of the parent sprite, we added it to this two cull list. Since our viewport never clears, and we render once on the very first frame of the game, our parent sprite will be drawn into the viewport and never deleted. This cull timer over here starts half a second after the game begins. It's set up with a single signal in its timeout, which just loops through everything in our two cull list and deletes it. So we only copy the parent sprite for the first render, then we'll delete it to free up memory. The last thing that we do before calling build collisions from image is to yield until the visual server's frame post draw event is signaled. If you haven't seen it before, the yield keyword basically pauses execution of this script until a given event happens, at which point it'll continue with the next line. The visual server is the API backend for absolutely everything that you can see in a game. And frame post draw is a signal that's fired by the visual server at the end of every frame after all the viewports have finished updating. Because our viewport is set to update mode once, we know that it's going to render on the first frame. Our yield will patiently wait until that frame is drawn into our viewport, and then we can call build collisions from image, which will use the sprite, which has the viewport texture set to our viewport, to create our collisions from what is in the viewport. So, this is obviously a lot more complicated than just taking a sprite, setting it as an image texture, and loading in our level, but it means that we can put a destructible node underneath any sprite, and it will suddenly get the ability to be destroyed. We'll cover the viewport stuff in later videos because we're also using it to hide pixels on our parent sprite. So it's used for both the collision geometry and our visual display. We've covered a lot in this video, so give yourself a pat on the back and I'll see you in the next video where we're going to talk about updating our collision geometry in real time.